welcome to another episode of Jim's Love and Garden. Okay, so the construction on this side is um, similar, but uh, basically what I've done is I've anchored it to this sort of cross member in the top. Um, but because I've not got any of these um, structures on this side, what I've done is simply just put a piece of bamboo down because um, I don't want to put any um, loading on the roof. So basically, I've just attached it there and uh, basically um, tied it in to each of the. Um, sort of cross pieces and that's just going to uh, obviously these these sort of ones that go down are going to take the weight of the of the plant so uh, the this cross piece really is just to stop it from falling over really that's all it's uh, there for um, just just a quick point always make sure that the that the top of the pole isn't actually touching the glass because what you don't want to do is put any strain on the glass so also you can see there's a space um, a small space between the the pole and the glass there's no um, you know, sort of actual contact there. So really, the poles are only touching the poles, and then the, and then the poles are actually um, only in contact with the with the with the metal structure. And all that this one here is doing, and this one here is doing, is just stopping them from sort of swaying backwards and forwards. So that's the that's the other side. As you can see, the poles are slightly closer together, um, but uh, these are, I think, if anything, possibly too close together. Um, they're a bit closer than the other side. These are about. Um, probably about 14 inches apart, um, which I'm a little bit concerned about because it's the it's not the root space because I know they're going to be fed well. It's it's the actual sort of space that the plant's going to have with its um, leaves and stuff like that. But uh, we'll see how we go, and uh, um, well, I'll uh, plant that up with the uh, tomatoes now, and I'll show you when it's finished. Okay, so all of the tomatoes, um, which are going to go outside and now outside. So I've got these are the money maker. I've got some um, some more money maker there, which was the second batch, and I've also got some of the cherry tomatoes there, which will also go outside. Not to mention the two experimental ones, which are these two here, this one here, and the one next to it. So that's the greenhouse um, finished. So what I've done is obviously planted in. I've got all money maker in at the back here, um, and in the middle, and then these first three here are the alicante and then these last two here I'm only growing these two there, the cherry tomatoes in the greenhouse anyway, there'll be some more outside, I'm not quite sure how they're going to grow outside but I'm going to give it a go anyway um, so that's the um, the second border of tomatoes in obviously they're a little bit more sort of closely packed than this side so I'm expecting the tomatoes from here to be possibly smaller and not quite as good to be honest with you because I think I've got them a little bit close but uh, we'll see how we go, so that's really the greenhouse now for the next um, couple of months at least, obviously all of the uh, the chickpeas and the uh, the lentils and everything, these are going to go very shortly. And then obviously as soon as we're out of May into June, all of the uh, the gourds um, are obviously going to go out. I've already got some outside here uh, and here, which are the sort of the, the large pumpkins, so they're a little bit hardy, so they're going out. Um, and obviously I've just got one tray of uh, sunflowers there, and I've got the sweet potatoes there, which are just sort of there temporarily. So, um, and that's it. But uh, the one, or the, sorry, the two bits of good news is I've um, trimmed down the, um, the the grapevine here. And as you can see, this second shoot is actually up to um, up to here now. So that's literally growing about four inches a day. And that's the, that's the second one there, which is sort of all the way up to there. So that's almost getting onto this pole here. Um, and some really good news, the ginger's come through. I don't know if you can see there. Um, with that little shoot that we've got coming out there, that's the actual ginger. So I'm quite pleased with that because I wasn't quite sure if the ginger was going to work, but that's basically just a piece of ginger that I bought from the supermarket and stuck it in a pot. And uh, so that's grown, so we'll be enjoying some uh, 
uh, Jim's later on. I've just got these sort of these few corns here in temporarily, and they'll um, they'll basically be potted up very shortly, and uh, they'll also go outside, of course. Um, and all of these beans underneath here are growing really quickly, so all of their all all of they're going to go out in the next week or so. Um, also with this uh, Nero kale here, that'll also be going out. Um, the the pepper. What I'm going to do with the pepper is plant that into a large pot and that will basically spend the summer sat here, um, sort of growing there if you like. So I'm going to keep it in a, in a large pot. Um, quite probably I'll put the pot a bit further down. I'll put it, probably take this out and have it sitting on the ground down there. But um, that's where the pepper's going to go. And uh, so that's the greenhouse um, all ready for the summer. So the two things I was going to mention, uh, when you first water the border, uh, make sure you water the whole thing with the sprinkler, don't try and do it straight from the, uh, you know, with the rose on, sorry, don't, 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 don't try and water it straight from the watering can because you, you're likely to sort of knock all the dirt everywhere. And obviously with the cucumbers at the back, go gently with them. And obviously with, uh, you know, you don't want to put too much water in, you just want to sort of make sure that, that they've had a drink. And even if you only do it once a year, this is now the time to sweep all of the um, the greenhouse out. Um, main thing being is if you have been pulling any of the side shoots and branches off the tomatoes as you've been putting them in, like I showed you in the last episode, they'll go all on the floor. And what you don't want is um, dead bits of tomato plant all over the floor because you're potentially um, encouraging um, disease and stuff like that. So any bits of the tomato plant that you've pulled off. Um, you know, to pull the branches out and stuff like that. Get them out of the greenhouse, get them straight in the bin or, or, or in the compost if that's what you want to do. Um, so that, that's just a really quick couple of tips. Okay, so I'm just planting the chickpeas um, out and as you know, I've grown these in um, plugs this year. Uh, and they're about, um, they're about sort of four or five inches tall now, so they're more than ready to go in. And I've this is well prepared ground and it's had a load of chicken muck in it um, and basically I'm planting them in two rows, the rows are 18 inches apart which is what's recommended and uh, I'm planting them around 6 inches apart the plants, so the plants are 6 inches apart the rows are about 8 inches apart and I'll, I'll plant these two rows and then I'll show you what it looks like when I've got it finished chickpeas planted for this year. As you can see they're planted six inches apart in between every one of them and there's, there's, we've planted two rows and there's 18 inches between the two rows and if you're wondering this structure on the back is for growing the lentils this year. So that's the chickpeas done for this year. So I just want to do a few of the comments that have come over um, in the last week or so and uh, the first one comes from Sandy Moth and she was saying what weed killer do you use on um, bindweed and stuff like that. With bindweed what you need to do is use a systemic weed killer because if you if you don't use that basically what uh, a systemic weed killer basically enters the plant and goes down into the roots and kills the roots as well and with bindweed the strength is in the roots so basically if you keep sort of cutting it off at the ground level it'll just keep growing back there's nothing that you can do and obviously if, it, if it's not a systemic weed killer all it will do is it'll just kill the top and it'll basically just grow again in a few weeks time so the best thing I can advise you to do is use a systemic weed killer the best ones um, on the market to my knowledge are sort of Roundup and Resolver um, these basically you just spray on or or you can get the one that, that you just uh, you know sort of rub on the leaf and then that will kill off the um, the bindweed down to the ground and then it'll go into the roots and sort of kill the roots off so that's the best thing you can I can possibly advise with that the next one also comes from Sandy Moth and uh, she was asking about uh, what to do with all the rhubarb. With rhubarb, um, and this is where most people go wrong, with rhubarb you should only really pick about a third of what you've got. Obviously what you need to do is leave the shoots and the plant uh, and, and the leaves on the plant to feed the roots so that you know you've got a healthy um, you know sort of rhubarb plant if you like or plants. Um, so what I always do, I always only ever cut about a third of the rhubarb off um, Later on in the year, you will get a second batch, and then obviously, you know, you can, you know, you can take some more. Then uh, most rhubarb will actually crop both, um, uh, sorry, twice in a year. Once in the spring, which is one of the first um, sort of plants to, you know, that you can crop, and then again, you get one sort of July, August time where you, you know you can take a second crop. But in both instances, I only ever take somewhere like a third or a half of what you know what's there, and I always make sure that I take it equally from around the um, the patch. 
Uh, what I do with all the rhubarb, to be honest with you, is um, I mainly make uh, puddings with it. And uh, what I do is just sort of chop it all up, put it into the oven for on, on a really low heat for around, um, oh, I don't know, about half an hour or so. Uh, possibly a little bit longer, say 45 minutes. Um, and basically what you need to do is macerate it before and so put about a tenth of the weight of sugar onto the, uh, the rhubarb. Mix it all up, don't put any water or anything like that, just leave it in the bowl for around sort of half an hour or so. Then put it in the oven, as I say, on a low heat for about three quarters of an hour and then you'll find that it's... It, it, that the little you know sort of cook really nicely, custard or cream or something like that, which is um, you know ideal. But uh, you don't need any more sugar than basically a tenth of the weight. Uh, so that's basically what I do with most of the rhubarb. Um, next one comes from Maria Wilson, and she was saying um, really like the music, and it sounds um, very much like early Pink Floyd. That's not surprising because I'm a massive Pink Floyd fan. Um, you there's, there's there's been other comments on the uh, the channel uh, you know sort of months ago by where uh, people say I sound like Black Sabbath or Metallica. I'm, a, I'm also big fans of those bands as well, but uh, Pink Floyd is one of my first loves, and uh, yes, yes, you can hear Roger Waters and Dave Gilmour in there, I know that. So uh, so yeah, they have been a big influence to me music-wise. So that's why it sounds like Pink Floyd. Next one comes from Foodie Lawrence, who's saying, how much time do you spend on the plot? Depending on the time of year, um, it, 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 it kind of varies. This time of year, it, it's typically the most amount of time because you're you know you're sort of preparing plants you're planting out you're doing weeding you know weeding is a really sort of time consuming job so at the moment I'm kind of spending about four or five hours on the plot possibly more than that if I've got an area with, that I want to weed I can potentially spend um, I don't know sort of two hours sort of going through and getting all the weeds out and as I said to you um, in, in a couple of episodes ago when I was talking about weeding you're much better off getting all the weeds out in one go then you'll just have the odd one coming. If you if you just take a few, um, then you'll find that um, you know more weeds will come. Then you you know you end up weeding three or four times one you know in, in one place. If you leave it till about now, where the weeds are sort of you know kind of that big in radius, you can you can pull them all out and then um, you know unless you disturb the soil again, there'll be no more seed there to grow again. So uh, so because of weeds and stuff like that, you know I do you know I do tend to spend a lot of time up the allotments. It's it's really ideal, to be honest with you, um, you, you know, regarding time, if you live really close to your allotment, and, and obviously, no, you know, sort of not everybody has that um, um, sort of privilege of living close to your allotment. I, I live very close to mine, so I can come up, um, you know, for you know just half an hour, do half an hour, a bit of weeding or something like that, and then you, you know sort of do that. So what I tend to do with allotments, I think the best way to do gardening in, in general, alone allotments, is do little and often rather than trying to sort of dedicate a whole day coming up and then you know sort of wearing yourself out which is you know which tends to take the enjoyment out of it really so little and often but I would say over the space of a week um, it, it varies but I'd say probably about four or five hours this time of year when we get to sort of June July time really when the plants are established um, unless there's watering to be done and stuff like that there's typically not that much to do so it, it typically drops down to I don't know maybe two hours a week, um, week or something like that. Uh, the next one comes from Tina Reeves. Uh, Tina's had um, um, some really bad uh, um, sort of damping off of a uh, uh, run of beans, and uh, I've also had a comment this morning from um, Ken Fuller as well. He's he's had he's had beans rotting out, and I think this is exactly the same problem as I've had with the peas. Um, I think this year because the weather keeps going hot, cold, hot, cold. You know, it gets hot, so you water things, and then and then it'll go cold at night, and basically the you know the beans or the peas or whatever is sitting in water, and uh, you, you know that's resulting in the beans um, rotting. Um, Really, that really, there's not really much you can do. It's it's just the weather system that we've got going on at the minute, and uh, and unfortunately, things like beans, peas, corn, and stuff like that are really suffering. Some people have had some real success. You know, I've had um, some of the people on, you know, on this field here. You know, they've had some really good success with peas this year. Mine have just completely failed. Um, other people have had really good success with corn as well, and other people have had complete disasters with beans. So it, it, it depends when you put them in. It's, it's, it's basically the look of the draw. If you put them in at the right time, when you've got a few good days, so they can germinate and they're away, then you know, um, you know. That's, and obviously, I hit the nail with the um, um, with the beans because they've all come true. I have had a few. I've had sort of I don't know a dozen or so that have not come through, and I've just planted some more beans. But uh, as I say, you know, the corn and the peas this year for me because of the timing again. You know, I haven't, I haven't done very well at all, so uh, I think it's down to the time. But Tina, I've got loads of, um, and and Ken, I've got loads of um, um, b um, runner beans. So if you want any, if you go to YouTube onto my channel, 
and go about and then there you can send me a private message if you send me your address I'll, I'll by all means send you some beans to, um, through the post uh, okay so the next one comes from um, Ken Fuller and he was saying he, he, he grows basil in the greenhouse um, amongst his tomatoes but he does water them differently obviously basil um, being a herb doesn't want too much water and um, you, you know sort of tomatoes obviously need a lot of water to grow properly but he was saying what he does is he grows his basil in the greenhouse um, along with you, you know in separate sort of containers or whatever but by his, by his tomatoes and he said that it grows really uh, it grows really well now basil really um, grows really well in the Mediterranean so it enjoys hot weather so obviously basil would do well in the greenhouse because of the you know the warmth and that um, but uh, that was a really good um, tip Ken so if you want really nice basil then obviously your greenhouse if you've got the room unlike I have but if uh, you know if you want to grow nice basil then obviously your greenhouse is the way to do it um, next one comes from Mark Davis and he was saying um, um, when he does his Victorian um, beds that I was, I was showing you in the last episode he was saying uh, what he does is he puts the grass in and then he waters the grass afterwards um, that's that's right that is the you know the way to do because what you need to do is add water to the grass to start the reaction off to get the bacteria to start breaking the um, to breaking the uh, the grass down wet which is what generates the heat which is exactly what you want um, to be honest with you when I put that grass in um, the other day it, it was already steaming hot it was already wet enough and what I find is if you put the uh, the soil on top and then obviously you're going to water your plants the water will go down into the grass anyway and you know, sort of wet it that way but that's true if the if, if the grass cuttings are dry or not particularly wet then then when you put them in just just put a um, you know a couple of buckets of water over them just to start the reaction off if it, if it doesn't already you can tell if it's working if um, obviously if, if, if the grass is hot then it's um, you know you know it's already on its way putting a bit of water on won't sort of harm it too much but I typically don't because what it can do is it can quench the reaction and you know and sort of slow it all down so uh, that's a um, um, good tip um, okay so the next one comes from Nigel over in Wolverhampton um, Nigel from Muddy Boots and he was saying about wrapping gaffer tape around the bottom of um, canes so basically I was, I was sort of explaining this last week and what I um, have used in the past is this stuff and this is um, this is aluminium tape and this is used for um, basically aircon systems and stuff like that. It, it, it typically gets wrapped around the you know the sort of the insulation that you put around pipes. Now I found that this stuff is actually better than gaffer tape. Obviously gaffer tape's the um, you know sort of this type of stuff which is um, you know it's sort of black sort of like sort of a little bit like material. And what I found with this is it, it obviously sticks around the um, sticks around the poles and it is really good but, but what I found is when the when it gets wet the, uh, the the adhesive tends to sort of unravel itself and it, it uh, doesn't um, stay on the pole. So what I've tended to use in the past is this silver um, aluminium tape, which is really good. You can buy this off the internet. It's not particularly expensive. A roll of it's you know a couple of pound or something like that you can get delivered. So what I typically do is just take about um, I don't know, depends on how far you're going to put in the ground, but I'd say about 18 inches of it. Now this stuff can be a bit of a pain to, uh, to be honest with you because it's got um, sort of backing paper on one side. Um, just to stop the adhesive and, and all you need to do is sort of peel off peel off that that sort of paper at the back and now you do find that with, with this if it, if it wraps back on itself and sticks to itself you'll never get it off but um, all I do is obviously start at, start at one end and what you need to do is make sure that you cover the end of the pole you know the bit there because if you get damp up there that's where it's going to rot so always make sure you go over the end by probably about an inch or so and what I tend to do is just stick it Stick it down the side, I'll show you in a second when I've done it. Stick it down the side like that, so you've got it level down, and then as soon as you've got it all the way down, you can take the rest of the paper off. This kind of stops it from uh, sticking on itself. Now all this is is basically like kitchen foil, but it's got sticky on one side. So, as you can see there, I've, I've, I've left about an inch at the end of the, of the what's saying, all become apparent in a minute, and I've just stuck it down the side of the, um, the pole like that. And all you do then is just basically just go backwards and forwards with your thumb, if you can see that, uh, just go backwards and forwards like that, sort of wrapping it around and every time you go down you sort of go around a little bit more and then you keep doing that until you get, it's worth you taking your time over this, um, you sort of do that till you've got almost all the way around the, uh, the pole, like that, and then the end bit there, what you want to do is seal the end of the, uh, the pole, so what I tend to do is just sort of bend that over on itself like that and then just, just pull that bit up again. So basically what you're doing is you're sealing, sealing the end of the, uh, the pole and then basically just carry on doing that again. So basically just run your thumb up and down like that until you get to the end. 
just doing this quickly, bro, so you can take a little bit more time when you do it. And then as soon as you get, just quickly do it. And then as soon as you get to the end, what you find is because you've wrapped around the wrapped around the pole a few times, you know that 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 will really sort of stop the water from going in. And this stuff, with it being aluminium, it will form to the shape. So if you've got say, any poles with knots in, obviously if it's bamboo or, or any sort of irregularities, what it will do is it'll it'll sort of form around those sort of shapes anyway. So you just get to the end like that, and then just make sure you've rolled the rolled the ends over nicely, like that. And then when you get to the end there, just, just sort of roll that back on itself. So when you push it in the ground, it doesn't sort of pull it away from there, because that's the bit you need to protect. And you can sort of put the put the silver on the end like that. Then Now when that's in the ground, obviously that will protect that bit from getting wet, and that's nice and sealed. So that's the stuff, but as I say, you can buy it over the internet. It's not painlessly expensive to own, so they do shop around because the you know, some places can be a little bit more expensive, but uh, that's the stuff. It's actually made by um, Idenden, this company. I just went on the internet and bought it basically, but uh, you can buy it sort of reasonably inexpensively. It's only a couple of pounds or something like that, a roll. And if and a roll of that's got, you know, I don't know, really metres and metres on it, so you know, it'll be more than enough to do all your poles and probably somebody else's as well. So um, I, I bought that years and years ago to answer you there, and, it, and it's, it's really lasting me. And that's not the only use for it, there's all sorts of uses for it. But it's got really good adhesive on it and it'll stick to pretty much anything. But um, if, you, if you wanted to protect your uh, poles and make them last a bit longer, I, I would recommend that stuff if you can get your hands on it. If not, gaffer tape is a good alternative, but, but if the gaffer tape gets wet, it tends to kind of start to unravel itself, I've found anyway in the past. The other thing you can do obviously is paint them, I did say before you can actually paint them, so just dip it in a... Dip the dip the pole in a in a pot of paint and stir it around, and then just you know just sort of get off the excess with a brush, and then just leave it to dry somewhere. That will also do really well if you've got some paint that you don't want. The next one comes from um, Foodie Laura, and, um, and and there's another comment as well from um, Scott Parker, and they were talking about how to improve the ground, and they were talking about wood chips and stuff like that. Now, if you've got a piece of ground in your allotment which you're not using, um, the best bit of advice that I can give you. Or, or even if you've planted it and you've got some space around the plant, so if you put in, I don't know, some, um, um, you know, sort of courgette or anything like that, around the plant what you can do is, is this exact same thing. Basically get yourself some wood chip and put that on top of the ground and uh, that will obviously rot down and, you, you know, put lots of carbon and stuff around the ground, which is exactly what you want. But when wood chip rots down, it, um, as, as I've explained before, what it will do is it will take all the nitrogen out of the ground. Now the bacteria that's breaking that wood chip down is taking all the nitrogen out of the ground to basically feed itself. So what you need to do is put in um, nitrogen to help that process and also to stop it from taking it from the ground. Now, really good sources of uh, nitrogen, obviously coffee grounds, so if you go to Costa Coffee or Starbucks or anywhere like that, they will happily give you the old coffee grounds that have been used. Um, now just sprinkle that you know, in the uh, the wood chip, and that'll obviously put nitrogen in there, and the bacteria will use that. Even better still is to cover it with um, grass cuttings. Um, so basically, put your put your wood chips down, and I would and I would recommend that you put at least six inches of wood chip down. That sounds a lot, but when it's rotted down, it goes to almost nothing. Um, last year, um, my neighbour Keith he had a, um, two loads of uh, wood chip delivered off one of our local tree surgeons. Um, it, was, it was kind. He, he's, he's really kind. He brings up loads of wood chip if you want it. Um, and that pile, I'm not joking you, was literally sort of three foot high. Um, and then on on top of that, we also um, got delivered a load of grass, and we put grass cuttings on top of that. And, and, and the whole pile was was probably about five foot high in the end. Within two months, that had gone down to about three foot. And over over the winter, it's gone down to almost nothing. I mean, you can see that there was a mound there, but. Um, you know, it does rot down to almost nothing. So what I would suggest you do is put at least sort of six, nine inches of wood chip down, and then on top of that, put a foot or so of, um, of grass cuttings, and all that very quickly will rot down. Uh, if you can mix it up a little bit, that does help it along. Um, you know, just get your fork in there and just sort of mix it all up. But uh, make sure you've got grass cuttings on top. And the benefit from grass cuttings as well is it keeps it wet, and obviously wet is what you want for the bacteria to you know, to sort of thrive in there and stuff like that. So if you do want to improve ground, most certainly if you're not going to use it this year, then pile loads of wood chip on top of it, as much as you can get your hands on, and then on top of that pile a load of grass. It'll it'll mulch the ground, it'll stop the weeds from growing, 
Um, the heat that it generates will probably kill the, or, or at least kill the majority of the uh, the weeds that are um, in there, and also it'll it'll feed your um, ground with loads of carbon and stuff like that, which is exactly what you need for when you're growing your plants next year. So I'd say if you've got an air in your lot that you're not using, do that, and uh, it'll it'll improve the ground no end. Uh, the next comment comes from um, the last one comes from Marina. Um, Wilson and she was talking about she put a comment on regarding the uh, the beans and I said last week when you know I, I grow loads of beans and then I blanch them and then put them in some cold water and then freeze them um, she was saying she does exactly the same thing but she puts salt in the water that she's um, you know sort of blanching them in um, I mean this will this will do two uh, two basic things and I have done this in the past but I try not to um, use too much salt in cooking to be honest with you. Since I've had the kids I tend not to use salt at all to be honest. But um, the salt will do two things. One, it will raise the temperature of the water. Normal water, you know, so pure water will boil at 100 degrees centigrade. Um, if you put salt in there it actually raises the temperature by around 10 degrees or so. So, it, it, you know, it, it'll be boiling at 110. So obviously it'll blanch stuff that much quicker. But salt also is a preservative. And if you um, obviously boil your um, beans up in salt then you know it will uh, it will sort of um, you know sort of protect that a little bit more and also as as uh, uh, marina did say when you, you sort of rinse them out in the cold water most of the salt will go anyway and uh, you know it'll um, it'll it'll serve that a little bit better but that was a good tip from marina i have done it in the past but since i've had the kids i haven't um, used salt and i've just kind of you know sort of stop using it cooking but if you haven't got small children then you know by all means that's a you know it's a really good method so that's the questions for this week <laughs> Okay, so I was asking one of the comments, um, what's the best thing to do with um, ground to try and improve it? Now, this is my neighbour's um, allotment, and uh, what he had delivered here, which so the road is just here, so what he had delivered here was a huge mound of uh, uh, wood chip, and he's had, uh, on, on top of that, there was uh, grass, so there was about, about sort of three foot high, four, three and a half, four foot high mound of sort of wood chip, and then on top of that... Um, he had delivered um, probably the, about the same in grass, so it was basically six foot high. So, as you can see, what you end up with is this uh, sort of fibre. I don't know if you can see that, but it's like uh, it is really good stuff, and it and it really helps the ground. Now, this ground is ideal for uh, growing potatoes or anything like that, most certainly. But um, if you have got a piece of ground that uh, you know you're not um, you're not using what I would suggest you do is cover it with uh, wood chip and then cover it with um, um, grass cuttings and then what that will do is it'll all rot down the nitrogen out of the grass will obviously feed the bacteria in the wood and that'll all break down and then you'll get this really fibrous um, soil and as you can see the potatoes are doing really well in here so uh, as I say if you have got a, um, a space you're not, which you're not using this is most certainly the best thing to do So, I hope this episode has been of some use to you. Please don't hesitate to put any comments or questions that you've got below, and I'll always get back to you. And I'll see you on the next episode of Jim's Not My Garden. And that's the...